Thank you everybody for joining this um, day two of the SIDS Future Forum. Very happy that you are joining us virtually. Um, the team is here in New York. Um, we were in discussions uh, all day yesterday with uh, SIDS policymakers and friends of SIDS um, to, to go through some of the critical uh, agenda items for the next 10-year um, program for SIDS. Um, we are um, seeing who else is joining online, but in the meantime, I think we can do a round of introductions so that you can all see um, who's here. Um, and then we'll do a, a, a summary, kind of recap of some of the discussions yesterday. Um, I hope that some of you will have been able to follow online, but um, in, in case you weren't in any way, I think it's useful to hear from the experts here. Um, uh, sort of synopsis of the discussions. So let me start um, by introducing myself. I'm Emily Wilkinson. I'm a senior research fellow at ODI, which is a global affairs think tank based in the UK, and I'm director of the Resilient and Sustainable Islands Initiative, RESI, um, which is um, a, a sort of um, been put the creators and the um, putting together the idea of this uh, since Future Forum along with our partners, Island Innovation, UNDESA, uh, UNORMS, AOSIS, and with the support of the UK government. Let me, and um, let's go around the table and introduce ourselves. Well, Malaka, my name is William. I'm currently a PhD candidate in the University of Adelaide, and I presented a paper on policy implementation yesterday. Oh, good morning. My name is uh, Giselle Lopes from uh, Cap Verde, and uh, yesterday I presented a paper on governance. Hi, everyone. My name is Gareth Byatt. I'm an independent uh, consultant. Uh, yesterday, uh, my piece was on um, sustainable, uh, well, resilient and dynamic um, cities on SIDS. Hi everyone, my name is Denise. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, but I am working with the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics. And yesterday I presented on the role of climate information in many of the things that we want to work on. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Matthew Bishop. I'm an academic at the University of Sheffield in the UK uh, and also one of the co-directors of RESI. Good morning everyone, I'm Gail Hurley. I'm with the RESI ODI team, and I'm leading the work on debt sustainability in small island developing states. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alan Blackman. I am an international trade consultant based in Barbados, and my presentation is on how natural capital accounting can enhance climate resilience for small island developing states. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rashid Bouhia. I'm also co-director of RESI. I'm leading the thematic agenda on financial sustainability. I'm also an economist uh, in UNCTAD in the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, based in Geneva. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. James Ellsmore here from Island Innovation. Hello, all. I'm Dan Hammett. I'm a, another academic at the University of Sheffield, and I've been uh, the lead author on the paper on sovereignty sales and economic revitalization. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good uh, Evening, where we selecting from. I'm Vila uh, Mikasnawan, Kurovinaka from New York. I'm from Fiji. Uh, my paper is on uh, opportunity cost of deep sea mining and the consideration of uh, ecosystem services of what the small island states provide. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jack Corbett, uh, one of the RESI co directors, and I work at Monash University in Australia. And yesterday, I gave a talk on a book that we're writing. Hi everyone, I'm Karuna Rana, I'm from Mauritius and I'm here representing the Big Ocean State Initiative, a newly launched uh, pan sits initiative to close the blue funding gap and my paper goes exactly on that, focusing on a fund um, that would target local communities and um, foster blue innovation. Thank you. And let's, uh, Good morning everyone, uh, Priya Mohan from University of the West Indies, Trinidad and I presented on Diversification in the climate resilience sectors. Hi everyone, I'm Courtney Lindsay. I'm also co director of RESI and senior research officer at uh, OBI. Thanks very much, colleagues. Um, 
just to let you know that the, the papers that um, were presented yesterday um, will be available. We're going to be publishing them all, so you will um, see copies of the papers um, within, within in due course. Um, let me though hand over now to uh, colleagues and friends online from uh, civil society to introduce yourselves, um, so we all know who you are. So uh, maybe we can start with uh, Siobhan. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Siobhan Shaw. I am the co-founder of Growing to Give. Growing to Give is a 501c3 based in the United States. We have a chapter in South Africa and a sister organization called Feed an Island in the USBI. Our mission is to cultivate and fortify sustainable community farms and gardens while extending support to small plot farmers in their journey towards environmental stewardship dedicated to optimizing resource efficiency, enhancing agricultural productivity, reducing labor demands, and ensuring access to nutritious food for our communities. We've recently been chosen among the top 48 for the world's largest environmental prize, the Food Planet Prize, for our strengthening community gardens across America, Africa, and the Caribbean. Thank you for sharing time with me today. Thank you very much. Um, and sorry, let me hand over to uh, colleague Sarah Peck, who is also online, um, part of the uh, academic expert team. Thanks, Emily. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Sarah. Um, I did a short presentation yesterday about um, how we can expand and strengthen civic space and civil society within SIDS. Um, so very pleased to be here and looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts and comments. Thank you, Sarah. Um, others online, if you want to uh, unmute and introduce yourselves, I can't see. Okay, maybe we name. can start. I can see Patrice there. Um, we, just everyone, if you can add, if you're able to change your name, to have your full name and your organization, that would be very helpful for us. But I know that's Patrice, so maybe we start with you. Oh, you're not unmuted. Can you unmute? Hi. Oh, we'll go with Dinka. Can you go ahead? Because Patricia yeah, can't yeah. hear you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Dinka. I come from Sao Tome and New Prince is a very small country, Portuguese speaking country. I'm a member of the CIA, is a youth organization work on small island development states. I saw my colleague uh, there, um, Karuna, and uh, thank you so much. It is always a pleasure to be on this webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you. And Patrice, I can see you unmuted. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I must say, I, I truly enjoyed all the sessions tomorrow. There was so much information. And the fact that it's a 10-year cycle puts more importance on the discussions. Um, my name is Patrice Horner. I'm in Bermuda. I've created the Utility Transformation Consortia and working with the government of Bermuda to design energy systems that can be adaptable and repeatable or repeatable on the various islands to try to bring a scale of deployment to uh, spread cost and yet rethink the way energy is delivered to a more decentralized, uh, renewable, smart grid, mini grid basis. So I think the time is ripe to move forward. Obviously, Bermuda is an ocean state with more ocean than, um, than land, and we're very keen on what's going on in the ocean, created a marine uh, spatial plan uh, for the various parties to look at ways to really grow the green economy. So I appreciate all the conversations on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. And can we go to Elgin? Hello. Good morning, we can hear you. My name is Elgin and I am a conservation from Seychelles. Uh, I've worked on many different islands involving conservation, monitoring and environmental programs. And I'm here presenting as a board member of the environmental NGO CR Seychelles. It is a youth led uh, NGO 
based on uh, encouraging the youth on uh, uh, environmental uh, initiatives in the seeds region. Thanks. Thank you, Algin and Dillis. Are you there? Good morning, colleagues. Uh, I am Dillis McDonald with Canary Caribbean Natural Resources Institute. Um, my colleague, Dr. Inka Grandison, will be joining shortly and will be uh, sharing a bit more about Canary and the work that we're currently involved in around SIDS4. But it's a pleasure to be on and listening in with the colleagues this evening. Thank you. And Stacy. Hi everyone, my name is Stacey Alvarez. I'm based in Barbados. I'm with Island Innovation, so it's a real pleasure to see this kind of um, gathering. And, you know, I can feel that there's a real sense of momentum and purpose with how we're going to discuss what we need to. And I look forward to like an active and positive solutions oriented discussion. Thank you. I, I think that's everyone. We also have Christian and Jerome here from our tech team. So thank you to you both for supporting. And if anyone else joins, we can ask them to introduce as they come in. We didn't miss anyone, did we? Back to you then. Emily. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, James. And um, really nice to meet you all. Um, we will we'll turn in a, in a moment to a, 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 a quick summary of um, the discussion yesterday, but I just wanted to first um, uh, ex explain why we decided to, to have this roundtable discussion. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly true that in the previous 10-year um, agendas for SIDS, there has perhaps been less civil society engagement um, than, than would have been ideal. Um, and there is a process now, I think, underway for engaging more civil society groups and youth groups and um, business sector as well. Um, in preparations for the SIDS4 conference. But the discussion that we had yesterday was really thinking beyond um, just the, uh, the conference it itself and what would be in the outcome document. We wanted to have a sort of brainstorm um, and discussion with the policy makers on um, where to go next and how to really deliver on the agenda. Uh, so we thought it was equally important to draw on uh, civil society expertise um, in this discussion because although we have a great set of papers and have um, engaged a number of experts and academics um, to, uh, to provide uh, research and evidence that can help um, in thinking about that delivery, we recognise as well that there are um, civil society organisations also have expertise. So um, as well as being practitioners, you are also very much experts and have experience and examples to share on how, um, in, through your work in small island developing states, on how um, progress has been achieved in the past, how things have changed, what the obstacles are and how they've been overcome. So we really wanted to hear from you um, about some of those examples because those are important to feed into thinking about um, how to deliver this next 10 year agenda. Um, and um, where, where we're at at the moment, as well as sort of um, the, the outcome document is being finalized, being negotiated, but there's also a process beginning now to develop a monitoring, evaluation and learning framework for the next uh, 10 year program for SIDS. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to be critical that that framework is informed by um, ex relevant examples, thinking, expertise, um, case studies, um, or the, from across the um, expert community, so everybody who, who's involved in um, doing research and um, delivering uh, projects and um, working with small island developing states. So that's the sort of um, the premise for this discussion, and we hope to have a, a really lively conversation with you here. Um, we will have um, very, so very short presentations on the sessions from yesterday, which were organized around the five uh, themes of the, um, the six four outcome document, which are resilient economies, safe and prosperous societies, a secure future, environmental <coughs> protection and planetary sustainability, and then the final one is around the means of implementation. So how do we sort of um, deliver on, on, on the, all of these agendas? What kind of um, additional resources and support will be needed um, from uh, the international community? So um, we'll, we'll 
we'll organise our sort of short presentations around those by uh, themes. But then I think we can discuss them sort of collectively in the round because there's lots of um, uh, overlaps and synergies between them. Um, so I think when, once we've done those presentations and um, the, the summaries from yesterday, um, we'll open up the, uh, the floor for um, interventions from, our, from the civil society representatives here uh, online with us to hear from you um, from, and from your experiences, what examples you have on some of these, um, the challenges that in fate that faced um, in small islands around these issues, how they have been overcome, and what you think the potential is for scaling up um, those, those examples and replicating them. So with that, let me hand over to uh, Matt, who's going to um, talk us through um, the discussion yesterday on um, safe and prosperous societies. Yeah. yeah. Hi, everybody. So um, we've got two of the presenters here. So Sarah's uh, on the call and Jose's sat just across from me here. Um, but what I thought I would do is just very, very quickly give you a sense of the main sort of overarching comments that came out of that session, or at least as I understood them and I kind of distilled them. Um, and there were five broad points that I, I kind of took from the conversation, uh, both the presentations from the two authors uh, and the kind of the comments that came back and forth from the floor. Um, and the first one is that there's not enough money, <laughs> which is something that I'm sure we're all aware of. There's a need for a, a lot more funding. There's a need for a lot more sustained support for the kinds of things that civil society um, in SIDS want to engage in. Um, and in particular, there was a kind of call for much more programmatic money, and much less uh, project projectified money um, because a lot of the great initiatives that people develop and come up with um, ultimately um, or, or often are kind of end up waning a bit once the money runs out. Um, the second is that there's a need for greater consolidation of lessons from across small island developing states as a whole because actually there's loads of great things that different civil society organisations working in different sectors have achieved in recent decades and years. Um, and some of those things have been scaled up to kind of regional levels. Some of them have been scaled up within multi-island territories. Um, some of them have struggled perhaps to be scaled up or they've not needed or wanted to be scaled up. But the broader comment is that aside from some kind of sporadic academic literature that may have used them as case studies, um, and the, the, the material that organisations are able to produce themselves when they have the capacity to do so. Uh, we don't have enough information. Um, we don't have enough examples of good practice that are consolidated in a single place where they're easily accessible. Um, so sometimes that means people are perhaps setting up new initiatives that replicate stuff that's already been done in the past and so on. Uh, the third kind of broad point is that we need to think intersec intersectionally about the the kind of the implications of different kinds of civic agendas that are pushed within societies and within again, SIDS as a whole. And the, the extent to which people are able to participate in civic life is something that cuts across class, gender, demographic, um, perhaps even race lines in, in certain societies. Um, and this is particularly so again in kind of, or it has particular contours in multi-island archipelagic states or archipelagic states where the experiences of civil society groups in different islands, um, the more remote they are, they face different challenges to those that are on the mainland. Um, so there's some thinking that needs to be done uh, there. A fourth point is that the AES region needs to be brought much more into kind of dialogue with the Caribbean and the Pacific, and it needs to feature much more in kind of global debates about civil society uh, in SIDS. Um, there seems to be a kind of great focus on the Caribbean and Pacific, perhaps less so um, on Africa and the Indian Ocean, and there needs, so there needs to be a bit more thinking there about how you can create synergies and linkages. And then the fifth point is that ways need to be found to bring civil society more squarely into these processes as active participants rather than kind of people or groups being consulted for information. Um, and that was something that I think came out quite strongly in both Sarah and Jose's papers during the discussion. Um, so they're the five points that I kind of took from the conversation that, that happened in the room. Um, 
I'll let Jose and then Sarah um, come in if they want to add anything. Jose? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Matt, for uh, the comments. You know, I just uh, I was just uh, thinking about uh, the talk of that when he first wrote this book, uh, Democracy in America, he brought the issue of the importance of bringing civil society into the development process. And uh, picking from uh, the Tocqueville's ideas and also from Robert Putnam, uh, an author that has written so much about the importance of civil society for promoting development, I would say that first, we need to see if civil society matters for seeds. Because many of the discussions that I have participated in, the question is, you know, this, this uh, development issues should be a government role. And the question is, to what extent can the government do this alone? Because they lack the resources, they lack the expertise, and you know, seeds as very small spaces, countries, we should uh, build on all the possible resources that we can have, and the civil society, surely they can contribute a lot. One of the things that I uh, highlighted in my paper, and uh, building on the productive capacity index that uh, has been put together by UNCTA is that when you have all the country's resources, uh, you know, uh, used in a coherent way through either uh, platforms involving the civil society, and also sometimes they call a private business, they call themselves that part of the civil society because they are non-governmental. So when you bring CSOs, uh, private sectors to, uh, together with government in the policy process, what you have is better inclusion. Uh, mainly the segments that are certainly, as you referred, you know, far away from the, the cities. So by uh, building on their resources, their knowledges, and also their needs, you are taking the right, the right path to a sustainable de development uh, process. Because as I said, initially, you have to uh, decide if it's important to bring it up, and then think how you bring it up. What I suggested yesterday is by creating you know, platforms of uh, governance, whether at the community level, the municipality level. You know, uh, I didn't have the chance to talk about the case study that I referred to my studies yesterday in Cap Verde, mm -hmm. at the municipality levels, where you, where you have you know, all the organizations of civil society, whether those formally recognized or informal, because they all have something to contribute. So that's the first step. This, uh, define <coughs> mechanisms to bring civil society and uh, build on their resources to promote sustainable development, whether at the local, I mean, uh, local uh, communities, municipalities, up to the global mm -hmm. civil levels. Great. Thanks, Jose. Fantastic. Sarah? Thanks, Matt. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think I had a huge amount to add, really. I think I, I very much agree with those those five points that you that you laid out. Um, and I think for me, I think that's the point around sort of consolidating the lessons um, from past initiatives and reflecting on and learning from the great things that are already going on um, within civil society across SIDS um, is really crucial. And I think being able to to reflect on and learn from civil society operating at lots of different scales um, is really important as well. So I think sometimes um, maybe we get drawn into um, considering civil society in very particular ways, but trying to think very broadly about different forms and types of civil society and what we can learn from, from this really kind of diverse organisational forms um, is, is crucial, really. Fantastic. So I guess we throw the conversation open now. Um, I think we'll, we'll go around and do all of the... Oh, OK. Yeah. We'll do all the sessions first. Okay. We'll do all the sessions first, and so you can kind of think about and reflect on all of the discussions from ah, yesterday okay. and then kind of come in um, on the ones that you're you know, most interested in or feel that you're, uh, you work on most closely. Um, so we're doing things in a slightly different order, just to shake it up a bit <laughs> from yesterday. Um, I don't know who wants to go next. Rashid, I can go next, yeah. Go next? Yes, okay. yes, I'm ready. Thank you, Mini. So um, the session I shared was entitled uh, Secure Future for Six. 
So the session revolved around building infrastructures, uh, improving connectivity, especially to support transitions into renewable energy, uh, engage in climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction. So the session uh, consisted of two very exciting and uh, insightful papers showcasing challenges, uh, initiatives and actions that could be conducted to, in two areas. Uh, that are data and statistical capacity on the one hand and uh, urban development on the other hand. So the first presentation by Dr. Dennis Brookey from Grantham Institute uh, at LSE highlighted the key role of climate information uh, in devising policies for climate resilience, for climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction in the Caribbean region. It revealed uh, based on interviews uh, with uh, 36, uh, 26, 26 uh, stakeholders in the region that the use of climate information was hampered by the lack of political commitments, the difficulty to use or interpret the data in the formats it naturally comes on, as well as a low level of awareness as to the existence of the data in the system. So the presentation made several policy recommendations, among them showcasing the relevance of climate information to stakeholders, improve the interpretability of data into policy, also uh, develop a data hub, support programs, strategies, and projects on climate information and scale-up technology. The second presentation by Mr. Gareth Payet uh, explored avenues to build more resilient and more dynamic cities and seats in line with the SDGs. Uh, it provided a whole holistic approach to do so. So the presentation listed a series of prerequisites, such uh, like uh, a set of principles which uh, defines a framework, including uh, also a commitment from all stakeholders, and it also advised for better governance, more inclusivity, among other relevant factors. So the presentation also highlighted several policy recommendations, among them increasing access to finance, straightening data collection, and enhancing partnerships. So the two presentations were then discussed by Mr. Ali Nasir Mohammed, who is the ambassador of Maldives and who addressed the challenges of seats to develop infrastructures uh, due to the intrinsic features such as their size. So he highlighted the need for enhancing a different form of partnerships, enhancing capacities, which include productive capacities and building early warning systems. And he gave examples of uh, challenges and successes in, uh, in his country, the Maldives. So the discussions were very fruitful uh, and they allowed us to really stress out some common grounds and outcomes underpinning the three presentations, although the presentation were not covering the same dimensions uh, of, the, of the general topic. So what, uh, what we, we, we take from the discussion is that there was a consensus uh, that uh, there is a lack of infrastructure and connectivity that goes beyond actually climate resilience and adaptation, but that also hampers economic, de economic developments and social developments. Uh, many islands, especially those far from the capitals, uh, blatantly lack infrastructures such as energy supply, transport, ICTs, and so forth. So there was also, I think, a consensus uh, that building infrastructure was really necessary to foster economic development, economic diversification, advanced social transformation, and then secure domestic resources, thereby strengthening economic resilience and curbing debt distress. Uh, so it's difficult to summarize all the policy recommendations into a broader set of measures, but uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, I classified them into four categories. So the first group of policy recommendations revolved around developing partnerships between all stakeholders at the international, national, and subnational levels. Uh, we highlighted a blatant need for boosting interagency cooperation between national and regional institutions. And also as echoed by Jose, uh, there is a need for bringing together the private sector, the civil society, and all other relevant stakeholders. The second uh, general policy recommendation referred to strengthening capacity, not only institutional capacity, but also productive capacities in the very broad definitions. So this includes productive resources, 
entrepreneurial capabilities, but also reactivate, reactivating uh, dynamic linkages. So it also includes nurturing human capital and upgrade technology. The third category of recommendations uh, which uh, came out uh, was revolving around setting good governance, promoting transparency, engagements, and, uh, and also develop sound principles to allow the proper rollout and completion of projects. And it should also be able to uplift access to finance via all potential levels. Last but not least, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the need for harnessing data and information on a large range of key factors was really stressed out. So in, in dimensions like environments, but also uh, in regarding the blue economy. So harnessing data does not just mean collecting data, but enhancing all the stages from data collection to data uh, dissemination, and also uh, enhance the use of data in the political arena. Uh, it was also said that data sharing across agencies should be further encouraged. And uh, um, I think all the presenters uh, highlighted, uh, I mean, welcome the creation of the data hub that is mentioned in the zero draft documents. Um, and I'm gonna end with, uh, I think, uh, one recommendation on generalizing uh, evidence-based strategies uh, to build early warning systems for different uh, areas of economic and social life. And that's it with me. Uh, thanks so much for that. I just, this is quite comprehensive, so I don't need to add too much. But all I want to mention is that there's a context and scale to which this paper was really um, concentrated within, and that's in the role of early warning systems and early action. And all I just want to mention is that underpinning early action, early warning systems, anything when you think about forecast-based financing, climate-proofing infrastructure, all of this is hinged upon the availability, dissemination, and effective uptake of climate information. So it's a very big implicit assumption that it's there. And my key recommendation and suggestion is that this needs to be boosted in order to build adaptive capacity for use within the regions. Regions, plural. <laughs> Although my work was based on the Caribbean. That's it. And uh, just to build on what uh, Denise was saying there, from an urban perspective, and I fully appreciate that, uh, of course, not uh, everyone on, on SIDS uh, uh, is living in an urban environment. It's perhaps around 50% uh, or so, but scale is always always key. And uh, just linking into uh, uh, Jose's uh, piece around good governance, the involvement of citizens and, and um, civil society uh, in governance to be able to help to manage how these urban and these suburban uh, places are actually developed in all aspects around uh, the ecological, ecological areas, how they plan, transport, energy, uh, fundamental and crucial to, uh, to how they, uh, they can move forward successfully. Great, thank you. So make a note of any sort of comments, thoughts, questions that you have from the first two summaries, because um, I'm sure you'll have things that you agree with or questions you might want to ask. Um, let's move into um, the next, the summary of um, the session on environmental protection and planetary sustainability, which I think a lot of you, sounds like you'll be particularly interested in given the focus of your work. So I'll kind of do Gail to provide us with a short synopsis of that discussion. Thank you, Emily. Really hard to provide a short <laughs> synopsis of this session on environmental protection and planetary sustainability because it's such a rich and exciting topic and we had a really rich and exciting set of papers looking at these issues from really different perspectives. But the core question that they were all thinking about was how can SIDS achieve global action on climate change sustainably conserve ocean resources and restore biodiversity. So we know that as custodians of some of the world's most exceptional ocean biodiversity and some of the world's most highly sought after resources like deep sea minerals, SIDS are very much sort of front and center and global, um, global uh, front and center of the global stage. 
at the moment. And there seems to be a real tug of war going on at the moment. Some of those who want these resources to be exploited, but exploited sustainably, and some um, that don't want them to be exploited at all, um, which is the case, for example, in the issue of, of deep sea mining. <clears throat> and so, of course, this is all happening in a context in which uh, SIDS are resource constrained. So there's some very real tough choices that SIDS, that SIDS have to make. So I just um, picking up on some of the key issues that were, were discussed. So um, we had an excellent paper on, on deep sea uh, uh, mining, uh, Fiji. And I think one of the, the issues explored there was, okay, when we're talking about ocean exploitation, where it's happening, I think this was an issue that was brought up in your paper as well, where it's happening, who is benefiting from that ocean exploitation first and, and foremost? Um, uh, which communities um, are, are, are benefiting or, or should be benefiting? And I think this is one of the examples you raised, uh, uh, Karuna, is that um, where we're seeing oil, where we've seen oil and gas exploitation, where we've seen ports and, and shipping, which are still the big blue economy industries, very few of those companies, if any, are domiciled in, uh, uh, in SIDS. And where are the benefits of, of these resources at actually going? Um, and then I think the issue that I wanted to, to raise around deep sea mining is that given those very real economic constraints um, that SIDS are dealing with in the absence of the concessional finance that, that we was a big theme yesterday, there needs to be economic compensation um, for countries that choose not to exploit those marine resources, those valuable deep sea minerals, leaving them in the ground, in the ocean bed, for the whole global family. Um, uh, uh, and that some kind of compensatory mechanism actually uh, uh, needs to be uh, uh, devised. Um, the importance of a much more coordinated approach and the need for effective coordination mechanisms to assure more effective approaches to managing the valuable marine resources and in particular deep sea minerals is, uh, is desperately needed. Um, a really exciting paper on the power of natural capital accounting um, as a potentially transformative tool to steer much better policy making and decision making within SIDS, um, decisions that can balance nature with the needs of local communities and, and their well being, and that these are now being uh, uh, developed and uh, piloted and tested in countries. Um, examples of Belize where they've been used in uh, uh, marine. Um, the marine space to guide better decision making there, and how if those experiences can be can be learnt from, those can can benefit other SIDs that might be able to make use of this kind of, of, of tool. Um, it was really nice to see um, uh, Karuna showcase some really exciting innovations um, within SIDs local, um, small entrepreneurs doing really exciting projects that are unfortunately often overlooked um, and don't get the funding that they deserve. And I'm sure she can tell you more about some of those. I think one of you might even be on, on the call. Um, and so how can we ensure that much more funding actually does get to some of the really exciting, uh, innovative companies and, and, and businesses that we're seeing, including those that are, are run by uh, or managed by, by women, and really challenging the international community to put its money where its mouth is um, uh, and support some form of specially tailored uh, blue innovation fund that can provide a variety of financing instruments uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises in the blue economy space uh, in SIDS would be, would be really beneficial. Um, I think there was a lot of focus on government uh, governance frameworks for the management of marine resources and how these desperately need strengthening if actually 
the uh, SIDS and the global uh, international community as a whole is, is going to exercise much better, more effective stewardship over marine uh, resources. And um, the ambassador to the Bahamas uh, put the idea on the table of some sort of world ocean authority to serve as the central guardian um, for an inclusive uh, uh, ocean um, uh, and for uh, as an area, uh, as a center of, of expertise, uh, uh, technical assistance, legal uh, uh, frameworks and, and norms around uh, governing the, the world ocean in an inclusive uh, way for everybody. Um, that totally did not do <laughs> that, uh, that session justice. So please, the, the three speakers who, who are here today, please feel free to add anything that you think I've missed or got terribly wrong. But it's, it's a really exciting area whether it's deep sea mining, natural capital accounting, thinking about how we can drive more finance to the local businesses that, that need it most, who are doing things in sustainable ways. These are really fast moving areas. Um, and so it's really exciting to see what is happening in, in, in all of these areas. So uh, thank you to all of the speakers for some really informative papers on, on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um, my paper discussed natural capital accounting for climate resilience <laughs> in SIDS. And I just want to add that um, the policy that guides climate resilience are oftentimes disjointed. So they don't properly address the challenges that we have with climate change. And it's not seen as a multifaceted issue in the way that it should, because it does, in fact, um, affect economies, ecosystems, and our communities. And one of the important things for SIDS that we um, constantly need to be mindful of is the trade-offs that we often have to deal with in addressing how we develop our ecosystems, our coastal areas, and having to balance that with conservation efforts. And natural capital accounting um, has shown through case studies that it could, in fact, be beneficial to give some direction on how you should treat your ecosystems and which areas you should develop, which areas probably might need more conservation efforts. Additionally, the um, financial implications that comes with um, climate challenges when governments that are often, you know, short of cash has to have to divert funds from their development agenda and place it into um, um, building back places that probably would have been damaged as a result of, of climate change, hurricanes, and so. And um, using natural capital accounting, governments would be able to identify areas that need more conservation, areas that are more vulnerable. And this can help with our risk management and financial planning and policy development. So that, that's all I would like to add. And um, I look forward to your questions and you reading the papers to get more insight on them. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this great summary. So basically, the paper um, that I did was um, trying to ask the questions about what are the big industries within the blue economy? Uh, where is the money going? Who is benefiting from it? Who is being left behind? And um, I want to highlight that um, the, the, the nature of the term blue economy is very uh, is, is very conflicting in the way it is defined, because very often we talk of blue economy when then we talk of ocean economy. But even within blue economy, you still have a lot of extractive industries, and this is something a lot of us might not realize. So, um, you know, based on the literature review and some data analysis that I conducted, um, I found out that um, the big, the big, uh, they call it the ocean hundred, some of the largest companies um, in the world that are in ocean-based industries, well, 65% of revenues are coming from offshore oil and gas, um, followed by ports, uh, followed, uh, sorry, followed by shipping-related industries and ports. And if you look at offshore wind, which could be a great potential for um, SIDS to increase energy security nationally, but also contribute as an ocean climate solution, uh, is, is less than 1% globally and literally inexistent um, in SIDS. And then I also, um, 
looked at blue acceleration. This is a term that's uh, um, literally defining, you know, su our sudden um, craze with ocean and solid resources, and there's a kind of we're accelerating on how can we tap into those resources. Well, even there, um, SIDs are lagging behind. So just a reminder, you know, SIDs are big ocean states as um, we control 30% of the world's ocean and seas, which means there is a lot of role that we can play um, uh, in terms of being a leader in that space. We are already champions of the ocean, but there's a lot more we can do in terms of, you know, blue economy and blue innovation. So after that, the third thing that I looked at is, um, you know, some of the case studies. And um, um, I looked at case studies in Mauritius and Seychelles, but I would love to explore case studies from other regions as well, because I'm sure the story is the same. And the focus on those case studies are really on exciting blue innovations that, as you mentioned, are not getting the, the funding and support they deserve. And sometimes the funding they need might be a minimal you know, $10,000, um, and, and they don't know where to go for that. There's also a lack of research facility, for example, in Seychelles when I spoke to Marriott. Um, for her seaweed-based um, um, packaging solution to replace plastic. One of the big uh, challenges she had is um, lack of research facility to um, go and conduct, you know, those experiments. Um, so, you know, based on these different case studies of, of um, you know, for example, an aquaculture farm, um, a sustainable crab aquaculture farm in Mauritius, and another uh, multi-step barrier to prevent pollution at source, um, and with all the interviews, uh, with, with the interviews with these three case studies and my own lived experience of having worked in this space for 10 years, um, we, the paper then, you know, suggested a, a specific um, blue innovation fund for SIDS that would be targeted to, uh, to all these, you know, early stage, small scale ideas, because when you think of blue economy, especially large scale, you know, we're all running in, running off to the large scale blue economy projects. What happens is local communities are often left behind. And a lot of these, you know, focus on economic gains rather than um, benefiting the environment of the community. So that's where this fund would focus especially um, to the local communities. And um, um, in the paper, I've noted down, I propose some modalities um, of removing barriers to access, for instance, of um, an exciting program such as, um, you know, Innovator Fellowship Program where, um, you know, a, a, someone with an idea, with a viable business idea can be given a time of six months to one year to really focus their work on it. Because this is something that happens in the global north. There is, they're all conducive, you know, nationally, the environments are very conducive to fostering blue innovation compared to that of SIDS. So, yeah. Um, that's, I may have spoken a lot, I'll let my colleagues <laughs> speak, sorry. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the, really, the summary of what was uh, discussed yesterday. It was quite a big topic. So for me, I'll try and make it very simple, because when I was walking here, I was trying to think on how to stick to the one-minute challenge. <laughs> so in the Pacific, uh, blue economy, there's no traditional uh, word for blue economy. The only thing, simply, that I can say is that in the Pacific, my grandmother and my great-grandmother used to weave mats, and mats for us was really sustainable development. Because that was what we would share in the social, environmental, and even in whatever economic we had. So that mat, in terms of that sustainable development, you know, the thread, it contains a number of threads. And quite a number of threads that I've heard today and also yesterday. So for us in the Pacific, we've been on that, on that mat, and the thread needs to be re -thread because the threads have become, because of the challenges that we have, we need to look at the, the resources that we have to ensure that the resilience is built. And for us, the opportunity is deep sea mining. And for us, we haven't really weaved yet that map uh, with the threads that are of in terms of marine resources. So for us is to look at that innovation that we need to look at. So I'll stick to the one minute. Uh, the paper is there available, uh, so, that is how we want to really weave the map. And the map uh, is, uh, is really our gift to the world because really it's for mankind to sit on the map. And in the Pacific, the map, we break bread, we share food, we go Talanoa, and we go Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, let's move on to the... Uh...
the fourth of the um, sort of thematic sessions, and we'll have a summary from Courtney on that discussion yesterday, and then just a quick sort of wrap up on the means of implementation um, discussion um, before we hand back over to you um, online for your thoughts and feedback and, and examples. So, Courtney, over to you. All right, briefly, so that the, um, the presenters can um, get even more time to go um, deeper into it. So ours was the first, and um, everybody was fresh and excited. So <laughs> it was a very lively discussion. Um, as it was on building resilient uh, societies, so we spoke about um, citizenship by investment schemes, um, debt, particularly whether we need debt cancellation, and we also spoke about technology use. So all these things as means of, um, of building resilience. So for... For CBI, um, you know, Dan took us through um, uh, the, the intricacies of the scheme, um, basically, uh, the need to rationalize um, these schemes in order to optimize the benefits, and all while working with the international community uh, to reduce the negative implications for SIDS. So um, these schemes obviously uh, benefit countries, SIDS, but they can affect them because um, they can crowd out local actors and affect SIDS relationships with, uh, with bigger countries. Um, but there are ways, and, and countries are using them as means um, of, you know, a source of, of ex-ante uh, disaster finance, um, so to speak, and also for, for social development. So the key themes, um, the key takeaways, how do we create greater transparency, uh, which is crucial um, if SIDS are, are to, to better able to, you know, take full advantage of these schemes um, and to protect themselves at the same time. And um, perhaps changing the name of it, we were, we, we were told um, by one of the participants that the name is particularly sexy and that it doesn't really represent what the scheme is and does offer six. So the next um, presentation we had, um, Gail, you know, took us through the debt crisis being faced by SIDS and crisis because the discussion then turned to whether it's a debt crisis or a liquidity crisis, um, what exactly should we call it? Um, but the main takeaway from this and um, the general um, consensus in the room is that SIDS need uh, debt cancellation, uh, particularly because they are trapped in a debt, in a disaster, debt disaster again cycle. Um, and the only way to get out of this is, is through some form of uh, debt cancellation. Then we moved on to Priya, who spoke about um, using technology as a means of building um, resilience. And um, she gave us some really good examples of countries using um, renewable energy and energy efficiency, such as Barbados. But the focus then really turned to AI and how AI can be used to, to off not offset, but um, to compensate, is that the right word, for the um, capacity issues in SIDS. So she gave us good examples of the Maldives using it to reduce waste and to also um, to do continuous monitoring and evaluation. So, you know, this is probably just a crude um, version of what they presented. So let me allow them to correct the mistakes I just made. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, good morning again, everyone. I would not go into the, an entire presentation, but I will focus on some of the civil society case studies in my paper. So the paper, the premise of the paper is looking at um, diversification, particularly into climate resilience sectors for SIDS in order to build our resilience um, towards climate change. And we identify Although the paper identifies certain sectors to diversify towards, which would include um, renewable energy and energy efficiency, clean transport, climate uh, resilient cities, um, knowledge-based economies, circular economies, land and forestry, and blue economies. And when we speak of diversification and access to finance, you would think that you want a lot of private sector engagement to drive this process. Um, but in terms of looking at the case studies across the globe, across SIDS, you actually found that a lot of the initiatives were coming from civil society. So the case of the Maldives that Courtney would have made reference to, and that was actually a civil society group partnering with a hotel where they're using AI um, to uh, have 
coral reef restoration and conservation, and it's actually the largest project like that in the world. I'm using AI, and it's actually driven by Reefscapers, which is a civil society organization. Uh, we had other examples, particularly in circular economy um, initiatives, where in Aruba, for instance, it would be um, civil society driving initiatives of collecting of plastic waste and using this plastic waste for jewelry making. Um, also, the civil society in Aruba is playing a big role in terms of educating the public as to the benefits of circular economy principles, because one of the main issues with circular economy um, products would be actually changes in consumer behavior, because as a consumer, you're now purchasing a product for life. So the civil society played a major role there in terms of educating persons um, on your changing consumer habits. And that's driven by civil society with government partnership, but again, mostly from civil society. Um, we also have the issue of ocean economy and forestry, um, two areas that SIFs uh, don't pay a lot of attention to in terms of attracting finance and monetizing. And again, we have civil society playing a role in terms of conserving these resources and helping to monetize them. Um, as Gil was saying, we keep these resources in the ground and we should be paid for it. So again, civil society is playing a role here in how we go about um, conserving these resources, but also um, earning an income from them in our fight against climate change. Very, thank you, Courtney, for the great summary. And very briefly on debt, in this whole question, which generated a lot of excitement around are we in a debt crisis or not, to me is a bit of a distraction because at the end of the day, the data is, is very, very clear that if SIDS want to build climate-friendly, climate-resilient, high-skill, competitive economies of the future, which is what they want to do, that cannot be achieved under a financing, the current financing scenarios, a business-as-usual scenario. So that, to me, is a crisis. <laughs> um, and I think a key message from yesterday was that SIDS have done a lot already. <clears throat> and it was said in reference to several sessions, including the, the resilient economies one, SIDS have managed their debt well. They've not been profligate. <laughs> they've used it to recover from disasters. They've used it to invest in transportation improvements, for example, in, in Cabo Verde. They've uh, made efforts to mobilize more revenues. And it's time for the international community to do its part and deliver more concessional financing and deliver debt relief where it's needed. We have a colleague here from Sao Tome in Principe. 126% of its revenues are currently allocated to debt service on public debt. I mean, that is clearly an unsustainable and extraordinary scenario which cannot continue. And what I would say is that civil society advocacy, both locally and internationally, on this topic is so important. We are at a really critical moment on debt. There is an acknowledgement internationally that something needs to be done, that current systems are not working. So we need everyone's support including from civil society, to, to really make the case that this is an issue that requires um, uh, attention at, at the highest level um, in, in policy circles. Thanks. Very, very quickly, trying to, I won't quite go as quickly brief as you, I don't think, you know, but um, very quickly, I think the, the kind of crucial points that came out from the discussion on the sovereignty sales was around, firstly, again, that small island states have facing debts facing a range of, of, of vulnerabilities have been created. They have found niches in the market, including sovereignty sales. And then as with other kind of niche industries they've developed, other powers have come along and said, actually, we're not quite so keen on this. There's a kind of paradox going on where they're asked to be creative, they have been, and then people get up in arms and, and push back against it. So there's a kind of challenge here to the ask the international community around what 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 are the what does good practice in the field look like? And I think there are certain examples we talked about in the paper, Artiga and Barbuda and elsewhere, 
where there's a lot of good practice already in evidence and that can be built upon. In terms of today's conversation around civil society, I think the real focus in the paper and, and Sarah and I kind of talked a lot about this extensively um, prior to the, the event has been around the growing domestic resistance to sovereignty sales schemes and questions that have been coming out through civil society organisations and community organisations around the sustainability of the schemes with concerns <coughs> around um, kind of foreign political interference, the uh, distortions to local economies, the lack of transparency as to how the funds, what funds are genuinely coming into a country from the schemes, what they're being used for, and increasingly questions then around what this means for a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, the risks of the re revoking of visa-free tra visa travel to the Schengen region, to the North Americas and elsewhere, um, and also then more broadly in terms of the impacts on local built and, and um, natural environments and so on. Um, and as part of this, one of the recommendations more in terms of civil society that we picked up upon were around the potential for funds from these schemes to be very much designated either towards reducing dependency upon external debt support of disaster relief, disaster financing, whether it's then also around kind of very much green transitions, green kind of economic investments, and also around how to be engaged with civil society to um, use the funds for basically supporting local civil society work. So that's the set of the kind of other debates that are going on, and I'll stop there. I think that's two minutes. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. So, so far, so good. I know this is this is probably a lot of information to take in. Um, lots of <coughs> um, really interesting research, quite kind of going into some depth on some of these topics. Um, but hopefully, some sort of high, um, high level recommendations that um, that make sense. And um, uh, colleagues have done a really good job of synthesizing is the recommendations coming out of the discussions. There was one other session, um, which I'll ask Jack just to provide a few words on, um, which was the means of implementation. So this was really an attempt to kind of pull together um, threads from earlier discussions around support that would be needed to implement the CIDS4 agenda, um, but with a particular focus on um, data and governance. So if you Jack, you're happy just to provide a sort of synthesis of that discussion and then we can turn over to um, the civil society um, participants to reflect on all of these discussions. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you, Emily. So we were the last session. There was perhaps a little less energy by the time we got to <laughs> session number five yesterday. Most important. <laughs> um, uh, we had two papers. The first was particularly excellent because I was one of the co-authors. Um, <laughs> yeah, William presented on the question of implementation uh, in SIDS and the second uh, that Colleen pre presented on um, data and data usage um, in SIDS. Uh, both papers emphasise the unique characteristics of SIDS and the way that um, that particular context intersects with questions around implementation and data, uh, which promised to be a really interesting discussion, particularly in light of um, the SIDS4 <coughs> meeting coming up. There's a, there was a sense that uh, after the Samoa pathway in uh, 2014 that implementation wasn't something that had been taken seriously enough uh, for various reasons, uh, that this was something that needed to be done um, with much more rigour this time around. Uh, so that promised to be a really interesting discussion. If I'm honest, I'm not sure that we really got there in the discussion. Um, the main reason for that was we sort of got sidetracked a little bit by the question of the Centre for Excellence um, and the Data Hub, uh, which are potential outcomes of SIDS4. Um, and there was quite a... There was quite a an in-depth discussion by people in the room who clearly had inside knowledge about what was happening in these negotiations, <laughs> which kind of got played out uh, across the rest of the meeting with all of us sort of interested. Maybe some people here had more of an insight than I did anyway. To me, I was a very interested observer into these negotiations, but felt like um, <coughs> a lot of that was going over my head. Um, which is a bit unfortunate because I think the questions that, um, that exist around implementation and the use of data and the question of whether uh, we want to treat SIDS4 as a sort of standard M&E process 
or whether we want to do something a bit more um, holistic uh, that would involve civil society groups in much more depth and detail, I think is a really good conversation to be having, particularly at this particular moment. Uh, yeah, so that's my brief reflections on that session. I don't know, William, if you want to add anything. Uh, no, you know, you're right. I, I thought there'd be more discussion on implementation uh, yesterday, um, which obviously didn't take part. Um, but we know what implementation is like in, in well, in the Pacific region. The challenges uh, faced you know, to get off the. Um, I think of you know my own country, Fiji, executive stability. Um, you know, after last year's election, you know, did a clean sweep of uh, permanent secretaries. So it's you know you had the Bainimarama government, and all of a sudden. Um, we have new permanent secretaries, and they're the ones that actually formulate the policy. So these are the challenges that NGOs in Fiji are facing. So, you know, it's all good for, you know, this government going, Fiji going, but, you know, you're coming back, they're starting again from zero. So then, you know, what's the point? Then you have the next government. So this is very important. Um, you know, if we really want the success of this agenda, well, in my country, then these are things that we really need to touch on. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. So lots of food for thought there. Um, and you know, very, we're very keen to hear from you um, in, on any of the uh, discussions that were had yesterday, really. Um, if you have particular thoughts on um, the recommendations that have been set out, if you um, are fully supportive of them, if you would like to um, add additional recommendations to the, the lists that colleagues have provided, um, and if you have any you know, further remarks or suggestions really on the involvement of civil society in any, in any of these uh, themes, I think particularly the last point, um, that you know, the role of civil society is absolutely critical to implementation and to uh, monitoring and um, reporting on that implementation because civil society is still there when government changes or um, um, whatever, whatever happens in terms of the sort of political uh, dynamics. So, um, I'm going to open up the floor, and if you want to just put your hand up, um, and then James, if you can... Can I just ask, we've had two new people <clears throat> join, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, so I'll just ask if they can introduce themselves, if that's okay. Um, at the start, we did have everyone else introduce them, so um, Harisha, if you're there, could you just quickly introduce yourself and the work you do? Marisha Savi, I'm from Seychelles. Um, I'm 20 years old and I represent um, CIA Seychelles. Great, thank you. And Anchor, sorry, go ahead, Harisha. Excuse me? It's okay, there's a slight delay on the line. Um, thank you very much. And I'll just ask Anchor as well if you could introduce yourself. Hi everyone, um, I am Kurt Granderson, um, Senior Technical Officer and Resilience Lead at the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute. Um, we are a regional NGO that works across the Caribbean SIDS. Um, and I'll put up my hand a bit later because we have been trying to pull together civil society to share some kind of ideas on what they want to see um, in the new 10 year this agenda. Um, so I'll be happy to share some of the key kind of findings that have come out in that series of dialogues that we held. Great. Thank you, Anka. And I know that Canary has been very active in preparation for SIDS4. I know that that's very um, among our attendees here to what extent you've already been active. So it'll be great to know also to understand whether, whether or not you've been involved in the process. So Patrice, you have your hand up. Um, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you. Um, those are very useful summations of the discussions yesterday. You know, well, the one thing that's obvious is that the civil society is going to have to play a role because there aren't enough resources to fund everything. So to the extent we can engage people to act on our own best interests and benefit, uh, the better. And in a collaborative way, uh, it was pointed out is better rather than an issuing edicts. Um, also, the SIDS has pointed out, you know, uh, encompasses 30% of the oceans. That connects us all, where we are mostly water. 
Uh, it is the atmospheric engine. Um, it is the largest carbon sink. There's an economic argument to be made that our protecting the ocean protects the world. I think that's economic uh, and can be justified and used as a basis for funding the activities on the islands uh, to have a, an economic output. Um, I like the idea of the World Ocean Authority, but knowing how long it took to take to get the high sea treaty in place, um, I was at the Oceans Conference for the UN when that was announced. It was a spectacular um, home run. And I think there needs to be some type of authority meshing the, um, the uh, marine easy zones and the uh, high seas. I don't know if anyone has any ideas how to approach that. Um, as far as data and climate, I don't know if you all know of the uh, Bermuda International Ocean Sciences Institute in Bermuda. Uh, we've been tracking ocean uh, data for 50 years. Um, it's one of the world's uh, most leading oceanographic uh, um, research institutions. It may be that it could be engaged in doing some of this data capture and storage through its networks with some of the other uh, leading ocean research institutes. Uh, they do have monitoring buoys throughout the Atlantic, and that's when I started to be very concerned about greenhouse gases from the large power companies on the East Coast and the uh, thickening um, temperature rise in the ocean, the shearing off of the storms that made them sit over the Bahamas and the destruction that it's wrought. And it was a lot through their uh, climatology division and um, their own monitoring. So I would definitely flag them. Um, and in that UN um, conference that I went to last year, uh, there was someone who has Ocean X, uh, which is a submarine system, not the one that crushed. Uh, but he and uh, Sylvia Richards, I think it's Sylvia, was Earl, Sylvia Earl, were saying that ocean mining may be inevitable. Um, so we need to take the leading edge on that somehow. You know, some of this mining can be outside of our protected zones and in the uh, large ocean, there may be a way to set up some funding from that. And um, the fellow that has Ocean X is, is a hedge fund manager with a real interest in this space. So maybe worth reaching out to him. Um, just a couple other, just one more point. I, I love the idea of the, the funder, the Blue Innovative Fund, <clears throat> but you may want to do it as a foundation. Um, because you can uh, get the 503CB um, benefits of people being able to do one, you know, donate funds, uh, have a state uh, bequest, and also uh, there's this quirk, or used to be the quirk, where people can donate um, appreciated stock and get the write-off on the value of the appreciated stock, but um, not have to take the gain on their uh, on their um, tax return. So yeah, that's very attractive to people who have re received stock options that have gone up and they don't really want to capture that gain and, and have to pay horrific tax levels. It's been shifting, you know, because of the changes in the tax um, uh, 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 climate or tax uh, horizon. And it's interesting, in Bermuda, we're faced with the OEDC minimum uh, tax regime. And we're looking at, if that goes through, you know, we're going to have to have this 15% tax that to our large companies, um, which we hadn't had to tax before. We're not sure how they will act, but it could result in a lot of funds. And we're, we're talking about using that to reduce debt, because even though we're a rich island, um, 
somehow we've really leveraged the heck out of it with debt and um, try, like the rest of the islands without as much um, uh, of the funds coming in on FX or, or other um, incomes like we have from reinsurance that, uh, you know, this debt for green swap is a great idea. Um, you know, so I'd like to explore that further and I hope I haven't taken up too much time, but I found the, um, the conversations very interesting and I, I'm very heavy on the implementation side. So uh, thank you. Might as well get that one out in the front, right? So thank you so much. You don't want to, we'll, we'll go through whoever wants to, so Siobhan. Uh, thank you, everybody. I, that was a, a great discussion. I appreciate being involved. Um, and as mentioned from the roundtable, the practitioners have the ex expertise and experience on the ground. So we're not only the doers, though, we're the visionaries, the creators, the inventors, the community, community liaisons. And, and I think that we see things from a, you know, that 30,000 foot view. We, we can change on the fly. Um, but we also have, as an agricultural expert, uh, we have our hands in the soil. We, we feel the burn <laughs> of the sun on our backs. And I can, I can attest to that. I, was, I just got a burn on my back um, being out uh, doing a, a project for a community farm in Phoenix, Arizona. So we see the firsthand effects of, of wildfires and the droughts and the torrential rains and the hurricanes. And, and we see the breakdown of society. We see the hunger. Um, we're right there in the trenches with them. And we see the, the challenges the small scale farmers have and the community gardens have to turn their, their lands into productive farms and gardens and to increase the the production that's coming off reduce the the labor the the um, inputs like fertilizer of course which the you know goes runs runs down into the oceans and kills the coral um, the water you know the use of lowering the use of water they they need these practical things available to them. So as a representative of Growing to Give, I also represent our extensive collaboration with partners um, in the Caribbean, in Africa, including Mauritius, I just want to say. Um, and I'm here to advocate for the inclusion of civil society into the, all stages of planning and impl implementation. And um, I think it's a significant and positive step that you're doing that. I think CSOs play a crucial role in representing the interests of the local communities, advocating for sustainable development, implementing grassroots projects as we do. And, um, you know, I think we need to be grounded in the realities of the communities that we are, are working with. And we have to ensure that they're better equipped for that long-term sustainability and success. Um, so I, I believe that, you know, we, we bring that grassroots insight and expertise. Um, we we're closely connected to the local community so we can facilitate the stake, stakeholder engagement, right? And ensure that those marginalized voices and the vulnerable groups are actually heard and considered in the planning process um, as we developed our collaborations, we find a host of challenges that are are being shared with us from the people on the ground. Um, you know, the slope, the problems with, you know, there's so many slopes, say in St. Lucia, you know, we're working with a farmer there and his his land is like this. It's good for billy goats, but he can't grow on it but we can bring in the systems that allow him to grow on slopes so that then he is able to turn that land into a better revenue source, right? Um, and, and then in turn, 
improve the food security on the island of St. Lucia, um, you know, without costing an arm and a leg. But one of the things that I think is, is the biggest challenge is the funding. And I, I know you've all mentioned that. So it's how do we get the funding to be able to roll in and implement the sustainable systems that are available to us, bring our expertise and um, initiatives like strengthening community gardens across America, Africa, and the Caribbean, how do we roll in and just deploy? Because we can deploy quickly, we can make a big difference. When I wrote the Food Planet Prize application, they asked me what we could do in 10 years. I said, well, within a few months, <laughs> we can be growing food and making a difference in the lives of the small scale farmers, the, the, the recipients of the food on the islands, in the you know the um, vul climate vulnerable and low income areas for instance in uganda in south africa where we have partners uh that are on the ground trying to grow food trying to feed children teaching uh people how to to grow more sustainably uh, help helping them to be more resilient but it's the funding to be able to scale and move quickly and and really make a difference that's missing. Um, and so I think that from my point of view, that is probably the biggest problem or the biggest challenge our, our partners face that we face as an NGO. We have the, we have some of the answers, but we need that support from governments, from, from, uh, uh, all kinds of groups. I mean, we we have an amazing support for from um, you know uh, you know funders like um, uh, in kind a lot of in kind uh, funding. You know, we we have statistics without borders helping us develop our data tracking systems for you know for everything we need for our agricultural projects. But there is a, such a need on the ground. That's why we've developed so, so, so many um, collaborations with groups. We have, you know, we're working with Green Harvests in, and that's Laura McNeil, some of you know. Uh, she has has made it, a, an, she's part of the land bank um, initiative with the FAO and the Grenadian government to take four acres and turn it from, basically jungle into um, productive farmland. Um, you know, we've got in Antigua, we've got land available to us right beside the airport that we can, you know, we can turn three acres into high efficiency, high production uh, farmland and grow for the community so that they don't, you know, the imports, we don't, they don't have to bring in as much food. Um, and when we talked to Samantha Marshall, who at the time was the agricultural minister there, she loved what we were doing and she wanted to, to be able to help, but she, you know, went through an election. So um, there's a lot of uh, interest from the local governments um, on, on the islands and, you know, from Mauritius as well. So, you know, we've got connections um, in Barbados, uh, members of our team are in, you know, Barbados, St. Saint, 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 uh, Martin, uh, Grenada. Uh, we've got a lot of interest from the Turks and Caicos and various different islands because they're all trying to figure out how to leverage their resources to produce more food, right? in less space using less um less of our precious resources and and to all, always consider how they benefit the environment i could talk for so long about this but i'm just i just want to say um i think you're all on the right track i i think that um you know i think just building that local capacity enhancing the food systems implementing sustainable agricultural practices, using uh, renewable energy sources for 
or um, agriculture and engaging land reclamation and reforestation projects and and of course advocating for any policy change that you know is needed so that there's uh, easier international support for SIDS I think that you know in a nutshell that's it thanks Siobhan I can see um that Anka's also raised her hand so we'll go to Anka Uh, thanks for that. Um, so um, thanks firstly for all of the great work that I think has been put into developing these papers and highlighting some really interesting, I think, points and priorities, I think, that should definitely be going into the zero draft document and hopefully influencing it. Um, so just adding a few other things that um, we've kind of pulled out um, from the dialogues that we've been holding with civil society representatives from across the Caribbean SIDS. Um, and so I'm just kind of going to read out some of the key messages that we've been trying to kind of synthesize and pull out from this conversation. Um, so maybe just to provide a little bit of context, we've had over 100 representatives from across CARICOM and the overseas territories that participated in a series of four dialogues that we held. Um, and these four key messages are what civil society and Caribbean cities want. So that's how we're framing it. And we try to align it with the key themes in the zero draft document and kind of talk a bit about how we think this can be achieved um, to really foster real transformation on the ground. So in terms of revitalizing economies, um, the key, Right, right, right to the good part. Oh, oh your part. There we go. <laughs> so, should I repeat what I just said? Yeah. We heard you right up until the key, and then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So, not sure what happened there, but I'll just repeat what I was saying. So, um, so the four key messages on what civil society um, that we've been engaging with wants, which are aligned with the key themes in the zero draft document um, and how we see these being achieved to really foster real transformation on the ground. Uh, firstly, in terms of revitalizing economies and all the discussion we've been having about the blue economy or the ocean economy is really prioritizing support for local blue-green enterprises, uh, which can help to deliver those triple bottom line benefits. Um, and ensure that more inclusive, environmentally sustainable and resilient development. Um, and so there's very particular things that we think um, could be promoted here in terms of better enabling policy frameworks, more tailored financing for these small and micro enterprises, uh, more comprehensive business support programs and financial services, helping to foster linkages with specialized markets and access to technology as well as land and natural resources to actually deliver um, their products and services and also special support to build climate and disaster resilience in sort of the changing context in which they're working and operating in. Um, and we also think it's really important to support these types of enterprises because they center on sustainable use of nature and benefit rural communities, women, youth, indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples and other marginalized groups. And so this is one of the sort of key messages that came out of the conversations we've been having. In terms of the focus on building a secure future, um, actually thinking about promoting um, the right to a safe and healthy environment and how we can deliver intersectional justice for vulnerable and marginalized stakeholders who are being disproportionately impacted by the triple crises of climate change, biodiversity loss, and growing socioeconomic inequity, we think is really important as we try to enhance food security, water security, and energy security. So I think while there's lots of really great discussions happening around these security issues and that energy, water, food nexus, 
Um, we've actually been noting that there's not as much discussion around ensuring rights-based approaches and thinking about how we better support access to information about development and different policies, um, ensuring that this um, these policies and initiatives are actually accessible to vulnerable and underrepresented groups so that can be meaningful public participation in decision making, um, also strengthening access to justice, and also thinking about protecting environmental and climate defenders from for all forms of violence, because they are actually trying to uphold a lot of the important kind of development controls and various commitments and hold government and private sector to account, but often facing a lot of backlash and trying to do so. And so we also, we know that, that was something that hasn't come out in some of the other conversations. Um, and then in terms of planetary sustainability and environmental protection. So I think everybody's actually been talking about this, but the key message here was um, making sure to scale up nature-based solutions to really support biodiversity conservation, restoration, and deliver these key ecosystem services, um, which include you know, promoting food and water security, climate resilience, and supporting livelihoods. Um, and so a real focus here on sharing knowledge and experiences on good practices, building up capacity and technical confidence to actually integrate these types of solutions alongside traditional gray infrastructure and supporting these kind of ecosystem search approaches by local communities, which are really important. And then alongside that, obviously mobilizing the financing that's needed and strengthening legal and policy frameworks um, is very important to facilitate this kind of scaling up and out of these types of solutions. Um, and then I think finally, one of our kind of big key message around building strong institutions is really demanding a whole of society approach with really meaningful engagement of civil society in decision making um, and as partners in actually implementing sustainable development solutions. Um, so this requires us really rethinking how we make sure people's voices are heard and people are part of um, driving changes in economic, uh, economic and political systems um, and rec actually thinking about how we create a new eco-social contract um, that really kind of speaks to all hands on deck, everybody being part of the solution. Um, so those are kind of the four key sort of big messages coming out of the work that we've been doing. And we'll be creating like a summary brief that should be ready by the end of March, um, which I think will be able to complement the different papers that have been developed as part of this process. Um, so I'll end here. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Anka. And I see Stacy, you've raised your hand. So we go to you. Hi, everyone. Hi. So um, I think it's been an incredible discussion, and it's really important for us to, you know, as we look at the lessons, think about what is actually happening on the ground and how there are ways in which it's, it's I'm not oversimplifying it by saying sometimes it is a matter of bringing the stakeholders together that need to be heard and looking at the intersectional holistic approach. Because if you think about things like financing, for me, it, the way I see it, and based on some of my research, the funds are out there. It's just how are they being allocated? How are they being allocated? And, you know, when we have the false divisions between things like adaptation and mitigation, you know, that in and of itself is, is quite a false distinction because the two things go hand in hand. So if we look to create projects that have a, an intersectional kind of resonance, I think that that, that will tap into to more funding. One of the issues of the funding, again, they're there. It's cutting through all that red tape to get to them. So when we have some more, for example, mentorship programs and inclusive programs that help to create access to those funds and help to bridge the gap between the funds and, and you know the various paperwork, the type of um, due diligence needed, I think that's something that would um, really go away. And in terms of things that we have done, um, we, I've seen the creation of the Caribbean Climate Justice Academy, um, which I led, I the innovation really kind of helped that along. Bringing young people together, youth engagement is actually a key part of catalyzing a lot of this, even say access to funds, because young people are very much in tune with 
how they need to progress in this world. They're the ones seeing the difference between the generations and how maybe their parents could access things that they can't. And also they're witnessing the schism between the generations and the separation. So as much as there's youth engagement, there's something that really resonated with me in Vili's story, I really about the weaving. And I think literal and figuratively, there has to be a weaving of, of generational experience. And that represents to me the social cohesion that we need in terms of empowering youth voices and also seeing how can we link them to building a kind of, um, again, intergenerational cohesion that when we empower youth through things like the Caribbean Climate Justice Leaders Academy, which really, as simple as it sounded, was a matter of bringing young people together, bringing people together who had incredible ideas, who had projects, and once they started to collaborate, we've seen two or three of them, for example, are, have put together projects that are now you know, vying for uni um, funding from UNESCO, which would not have happened had they not come together, but crucially pooled resources and seen how can they actually scale up their projects, because that's another thing. Projects are often too small. We, we get, we have this lack mentality where we think, oh, you know, if I don't ask for much, I, I, you know, that's, I'll get it. It's actually the opposite. For it to be worth an investment in lots of ways, there has to be a pooling. And we've seen that actually inter-regional collaboration is crucial, not just intra-regional. It's got to be inter-regional. And then um, I'll, I'll end by just saying that I, James will know, I always love to, <laughs> to advocate the use of a different acronym. So I never say SIDS anymore, Small Island Developed States. We, we reference the ocean and how big we are. I always say big ocean striving state. So I say boss. And I think if this was called the boss future forum civil society, that would just have a different yeah. resonance, right? And just have us thinking in a different way. So, and sometimes it is very much about the narrative and how we frame it. Okay, so, so I'll end there because the like to one, I could go on <laughs> for a while. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Stacey. I think Karuna looks really happy that you, uh, <laughs> that you made that point. Um, Elgin or Harisha, you didn't raise your hands, but I'm wondering if I can put you on the spot, um, just if you have any comments about the work that Sia um, has been doing, if there has been any engagement with CIS4, or more generally, if you have any comments about civil society in the Seychelles and some of the challenges that, um, that, that you faced with um, org organization. It, it can be brief. Um, hi. Arisha here. So I know for SIA um, Regional, basically, um, we did appoint myself um, as um, a member of the steering committee. Um, so I am part of the working group one that is um, helping to create the agenda for the youth summit that will be happening. And there's also another member of CSA Seychelles. Vicky Alice, who is also part of the steering committee, and we, um, Elgin is going to be the one representing um, CIA Regional in the conference. So, yes, and I will be representing Seychelles in the youth conference. And then, in terms of what we have done in the civil um, society in Seychelles, basically. We as CS Seychelles, we've done a lot over the years that we've been active. We made um, in 2014, I believe, um, we made the, a petition to ban plastic use in Seychelles, which was a really big issue. So it is also, it's still um, in terms of waste management in Seychelles, we still have a lot of issues because our landfill um, usually always have like random fires. So waste management is an issue in Seychelles. And when I went to, uh, I represented um, Seychelles in Mauritius and we were in um, agreement, Seychelles was in an agreement to um, find a way um, in collaboration with Mauritius's um, waste management system to help Seychelles um, find a way to reduce and um, sort out our waste um, better so that we will stop having landfill fires because we are a very small island. So whenever we have landfill fires, it's very, it's very bad because we have to close down the school, close down workplaces. Um, and also, I'm trying to figure out on top of my head right now. 
um we do participate a lot um with the youth so we um our one of our term is um we are youth led ngo so everything we do is for the youth by the youth um we engage a lot with the community um we do monthly hikes doing um to continue to engage the youth to have volunteerism so because that is um an issue also in Seychelles that youth nowadays do not want to volunteer to do things um if they're not getting paid they will not want to do it so we try our best to make events kind of fun and interactive so that they would want to volunteer so yeah that is briefly a bit of what we do in SIA and Seychelles thank you thank thank you very much um thanks everyone for your uh, your contributions and insights to discuss this discussion really fascinating and different things that we didn't um talk about yesterday so th this is very much appreciated um what what we're going to do is just to sort of um, get some um, reflections and responses from um the experts here what we're planning to do is to uh write a um summary report outcome document from the Sins Future Forum, which will um, include uh, sort of framing and, and narratives and suggestions and recommendations from both the discussions yesterday and today. Um, so we, we, you know, we, we, our intention is to include as much as we can of what you have um, shared with us. Um, so, and because that's, going, that's a collective effort, um, I mean, I think Matt will be holding the pen, but um, <laughs> we, will, we very much expect everybody to be contributing to that. Um, I think now would be good if anybody has any sort of feedback or points of clarification from what has been shared by our civil society um, friends, that now would be a good time to clarify or to follow up, just because um, we want to make sure we've captured really well what you've said. So, yeah. Let's let's get to any sort of reactions from here. Okay. Oh. I'll just because of the one. Yeah, yeah, just one thing. The really uh, took my thoughts was the social contract, and that's uh, really something quite important in terms of how we will shape the SDGs, post yeah. SDGs, now, and also how it aligns to the seeds for also the Paris Agreement. I think it gives an excellent opportunity. But just reflecting on data is quite important. So I think one is to look at the UPR process integrated with the voluntary national reviews. And I've been looking around, so I've, one of the things that I looked at was in what's happening in Hawaii, green growth. Mm -hmm. So they've got a dashboard in terms of how they quantify the investment. And so they open up a pipeline really of investment, but really looking at how data is collected from civil society and also from various organizations. So it goes back to that map, uh, that map of weaving. So they look at, you know, government sets the policy, uh, business comes with the innovation, and also the funding. I think funding is one option. And then, you know, in terms of civil society, really down being boots on the ground. So I think that's one of, one of the possible solutions is that. But here, yeah, it's really great to have the youth engage in this process. Thank you. Uh, so before I give my my perspectives or response to what was shared, actually, um, uh, Dinka, who was online, is is one of my colleagues from from SIA, and he said he's had a power outage, so he sent me some stuff to share. <laughs> if that's okay, so um, yeah, so he uh, Dinka is from SIA South Tome Impressive, which is um, part of the SIA regional um, organization, and. Um, um, he wanted um, to share, um, you know, some recommendations based on having more funding program for youth initiatives. I mean, we've all been talking about funding, but especially um, uh, youth-led initiatives face even a um, bigger challenge. Um, he also mentioned creating exchange programs between young people, and one example was the uh, between Seychelles and Mauritius. I know Seychelles had led a Blue Economy Internship Program whereby they have young people uh, before they go, they choose what they're going to study in, at, in, in universities. They were given the chance to explore the different blue economy sectors in Seychelles, but also Mauritius, and that was like a good exchange. And uh, he, speaking of exchanges, he said, you know, sharing best practices among the different um, SIDS countries, because we 
seem to do that well in CIA. Uh, we're not perfect, but um, as you know, AIS region um, is very disintegrated. Um, we, I think we are like the one example of how we are working together. Even if it's a youth-led organization, we are working together. Um, and then more capacity building for um, non-for-profits, especially for youth ones, because they're young people and they start off um, at a young age and, you know, leading an organization at a young age, um, it, it's different. You know, you don't have the same starting point as some other more senior, um, you know, professionals who are, who've led organizations for a long time. So we tend to forget about non-for-profits and young people. So, um, yeah, that was from my colleague. Um, I wanted to make sure it's, it's you know, uh, it's shared here. But quick responses, um, I want to say is first, um, you know, I love the idea of the foundation when you, um, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, <laughs> and I see utilitytransformation.net there. Patrice, okay, Patrice, yes. So, um, great idea, I love the idea of the foundation because we are, the paper is exploring ways of how can we, you know, get funding into, into um, such a fund. And um, I think it's a great idea because a lot of the funding that would be required would be patient capital because we're looking at, you know, these risky areas of innovation that might take time um, to develop, especially in, um, in countries, um, you know, like SIDS where resources are a little more restricted and um, all of that. So I think that's a great idea and I'd love to connect, you know, afterwards to discuss more. Um, and then I just wanted to, you know, shout out to, to Stacy. I love it, uh, the, the boss. <laughs> I, I made it my mission this year um, to, you know, change the narrative. I even set up a whole organization around it called Bossy, you know, Big Ocean State Initiative. It was very intentional. So, you know, I welcome that and I, I invite everyone here to please take that and, you know, run with it. <laughs> And uh, uh, lastly, I wanted to, you know, a big shout out to my colleagues from, from CI. As I mentioned, I'm also um, one of the co-founders of CI. And this was 10 years ago. I'm no longer youth, but it makes me proud to see that what we set up 10 years ago is still thriving. And we have younger people who are 20 leading. So thank you. Well, I just uh, want to comment on a point. When uh, well, I didn't get her name Hates this. Uh, she said that no, yeah, friends are there. Uh, what maybe we need to do is to mentor organizations, you know, mm -hmm. on how to get those funds. Those funds. I just want to bring an example again from uh, uh, We have a, a program that is being funded by the European Union that is to uh, implement a capacity building program in Lusophone countries and also Timor-Leste. So we have four seats uh, benefiting from the program that uh, is training institution, institutions on how to manage uh, finances, its own public finances, but also training many, when I say institutions, government institutions like uh, court of audits and uh, staff in the Ministry of Finance in the uh, <coughs> parliament, but also civil societies on how to monitor how government is implementing political policies. So that's really important because uh, you ask about funds, but if you don't have you know, uh, an efficient monitoring process on how funds are being implemented, so you may use it uh, not in a very, uh, I would say, appropriate way that in a way to benefit the people. So you have to have institutions out of the government to monitor and guarantee that uh, funds are being implemented. And another uh, example is what she said, you have many uh, institutions, uh, uh, civil society uh, organizations, mainly in the environmental sectors, and they clearly said, we are getting funds from outside partners and not uh, from government institutions, because they have been, you know, capacitating their, uh, themselves to the end. So if you have uh, effective programs of, I mean, that uh, invest on capacity building of social actors, social side actors, you're also creating venues to bring outside, outside funds, not through government, and that will somehow uh, contribute you know, to, to capacity building of the nation and more productivity and uh, perhaps uh, giving their contributions to sustainable uh, development. So that's a very interesting point. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Any other? Just, just a small point on that um, with the accessibility of the funds. One thing um, that many of the philanthropic institutions require the 501c3 US status to access those funds, um, which is a huge barrier for many of the civil society organizations. So there are other barriers as well, but I wanted to highlight that one specifically. Um, and so um, in a few cases, um, our, a partner of ours um, that does have that 501c3 has been able to take that funding from philanthropic organizations in the US and then disperse it mm -hmm. um, to SIDS organizations. Um, and there's, there's no issues with that disbursement as long as there is a vehicle, but the, the, the philanthropic or foundations are really limited in how they can give that funding. And so um, uh, in some of the SIDS countries as well, the setup of how NGOs are registered um, is either limited or just very, very different to US or European funding. Mm -hmm. And so the philanthropic organizations just can't uh, recognize the type yes. of institutions that the local organizations might be registered at. Or, 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 or often, I would just add, many of the civil society organizations are not officially organizations. They're informal groups of people that are not uh, registered in any format, uh, but they actually still provide a really important role. Is that Siobhan? I just wanted to um, reiterate your comment, James, um, as a 501c3 uh, leader in the United States. That is why we're finding collaborations from all, you know, from the SIDS, from Africa. Um, it, and we're now, you know, getting calls from Latin America, Peru, and, and we're you know, something like the Food Planet Prize, a $2 million prize, um, to be in the running for that is very exciting for us because what we'll be able to do when we win that prize in July is to be able to immediately, immediately deploy systems to all our collaborative uh, partners on the islands in, in Africa and in Peru um, and because they struggle, they can't apply for a lot of a lot of the funding that uh, an organization like ours, even though we're we're early in our development for you know funding, we've been around about four years and we've you know we've proven out our systems and our our agricultural practices, and we you know we have a robotic manufacturing line you know, ready to spit out all the things that we need to, to bring to to the small scale farmers and the community gardens across the globe, basically, to enhance their production uh, and, re, you know, improve just everything about their, their operations and, and uh, always, of course, focus on sustainability and all the SDG goals. I think we, we cover about 14 of the 17 SDG goals with what we do. Um, and I, I think that something like that kind of funding, we could help. We have probably about 30 partners right now. They all need sustainable farming systems to improve their, their operations and to in, in turn improve food security in their regions. And they don't, they don't have access to that. So we've become the go-between. We are currently writing grants with organizations, um, that grants American foundations have the funds and they're putting out the, you know, the grants. And so we're able to write them on behalf of, say, our Uganda partners or, you know, partners um, in Grenada. Uh, if, if the, if the um, if the grant is international in scope, so you know, for instance, our partner in Grenada, Green Harvest, um, she's got these great col collaborations with the FAO and the government of Grenada. They have this four acres from the land bank, but they don't have the funding to retrofit that space into a high efficiency farm, a sustainable farm. And so that's why she's partnered with us because we have a better opportunity to be able to access those funds, but it's a very competitive field. And uh, 
nobody nobody has really seen what we've done except if you know a few eyes on it um and so you know if, if the entire round table came to one of our demonstration farms you you'd all be hooked <laughs> you'd be you'd understand the processes you'd understand what we're able to do for community um and you would be able to speak to the the farmers that we're working with that are struggling um to to not only put food on their own tables but to um, put food on the tables of the many, many, many vulnerable people in their communities. So I just wanted to reiterate that absolutely a 501c3 is a valuable commodity for funding. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just, just one point I just wanted to pick up uh, that uh, Anka mentioned about the support to building climate and disaster resilient, resilient infrastructure and uh, how you build the capacity, the technical skills, scaling up nature-based solutions. There many, many examples around the world, of course, but context thought is always, always key. So uh, um, just some, some more food for thought for me on uh, how the private sector can potentially help with that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I've been thinking about as you've all been speaking and um, reflections from colleagues here is how to capture some of this in um, the, the monitoring and evaluation framework of the um, SIDS, um, uh, the next 10 years SIDS agenda. I think Jack alluded to this um, in his comments on the uh, means of implementation session yesterday. Um, but it seems to me that to, to not include it um, would be um, a big uh, omission. And um, so I think this is something we can kind of take forward and it would be good to sort of brainstorm further suggestions we could be making to UNDESA, which is the UN agency that will be responsible for creating this monitoring evaluation framework, was in the process of doing that. Um, so any thoughts on that as well would be useful to discuss. Can, can, I, can I just sense check, um, say something and see what people think? I mean, the, we keep talking about this monitoring and evaluation framework, and people keep using the term monitoring and evaluation framework, and Jack and Emily and other colleagues have heard me say this a few times. But it seems to me that we're not just talking about an M&E framework. And I, I worry a bit sometimes that there's a danger that the 10-year agenda ends up with a whole bunch of indicators and boxes to be ticked that just look like the SDGs or whatever. And it seems to me that actually we're talking about something that's potentially much bigger and or deeper than a monitoring and evaluation framework, but probably also should be a bit narrower. So there shouldn't be millions of indicators. But it also has to be something that's much more substantive and significant than just an M and E framework. And I worry that the fact that we keep using this language potentially um, potentially hints at something that's going to be very broad but shallow, whereas what's really needed is something that's deep and narrow. If that, make, if that makes sense, right? It, it needs to be an implementation framework. Mm -hmm. It needs to be an agenda that is, is more than just let's tick boxes and see which countries are at these particular targets. I, I don't think that takes us very far. Terms potentially, but no, I mean, people don't have to agree with me on that. I just I'm just keen to sense check that as an idea because that's something I'd quite like to write in if people don't mind me doing so. Mm. Can I quickly react to that? I think this is very relevant what you're saying, and uh, I think uh, this notion of accountability, and you know, because we're dealing with different stakeholders here, and there are like expectations, you know, of the stakeholders, be they from the global governance national or regional, whatever. And this, I think, is a notion that is not in the SDGs. In the SDGs, you just look at the macroeconomic aggregates, and we see whether the country, but then it's really hard then to connect about, you know, to connect about who, who failed. <laughs> you know, yesterday we heard, like, there was some failure from the UN, failure from, I don't know whom, from the national institutions. And I think this, if we want really to have, uh, you know, some form of monitoring, you know, I like to connect to map all the, you know, all the, the, the outcomes of the, zero, the, the draft documents, if we can map them with some stakeholders, <coughs> at least, I think the statistician or whatever, the data analyst who, are, who will be in charge of like monitoring or building those indicators, I think it would be an easier task because this is a political negotiation, you know, first, you cannot just expect a statistician or whatever to come and say, yo, you have, you have failed on this, you have failed. I think there, is, there must be some pre-discussions to see, okay, we we take this this accountability 
like uh, the UN or whoever, and then try to find the, the appropriate indicators. But I'm not saying this is easy, or and I'm I'm sure uh, probably there will be some resistance, but it would be the ideal scenario, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, the, what came to mind was, um, um, in terms of accountability, it was, the, it was almost like, remind me of uh, something like the UPR process, where the government should have the universe period review, where the governments take the initiative to say what they have done, and then you have countries that you know have a look at it, and then you have the societies give their reports in. So, if you look at the UPR process, I think it has to be driven within the government, but to be honest. It's, Something that needs to come from within, yeah. because if they, you know, if they're trying to tick all the boxes, they'll just like, you know, it won't be sincerely mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the old guard process, if you're familiar with it, it has to be, but it gets checked by other. So does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I was just uh, taking on that. Uh, I was just thinking about the idea of umbrella reports. Like in Gambia, we have many umbrella reports from some uh, civil society organizations. Uh, you know that contrasts with the government indicators. Mm -hmm. So you have those indicators that have to be measured by government entities that are responsible for uh, those sectors, but you have some uh, civil society organizations that, you know, kind of contrast, uh, do their research and kind of contrast uh, I mean, what the government says just to have a balance. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's one, one mechanism that may work at least at the national level. So. Sarah. Yeah, just on the EPR. So we looked at in the Pacific. There were challenges because, like the statistician, mm -hmm. he's the same person who's collecting the EPR data, also collecting the VNR data. So and the same person doesn't have the capacity to do that. So there's got to be some kind of integration. So mm -hmm. that's why that that the indicator or that data it has to be quite important mm -hmm. because in terms of looking at water issues in Tuvalu. One of the thing was to look at collection of water. So everybody had water tanks, and that was how the development finance was sort of written. They get water tanks. But the issue was they have been droughts. So whatever water tanks you had, they tick the box. Mm. But they're having droughts. So those are the kind of thinking that needs to go into this kind of process because I think that really touched me in terms of the social contract. Because one of the challenges we had in the Pacific was the youths when we came with the SDGs. They said, we have no say on this. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so that's why I was very happy with the youth city today, because those are the things that we really need to look at. So, yeah, I'll mm -hmm. stop there. Did somebody have their hand up? Okay. 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 Anka? Would you like to go ahead? Hi, yes. I just wanted to echo um, that I agree with the comment that was made about the need for something that's deeper and narrower than broad and like, exhaustive in terms of monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And I want if, I think kind of following on what Karma Bio named the speaker kind of suggested that we really want to talk more about a roadmap and implementation plan that integrates these targets and indicators into it um, and not this kind of separate monitoring evaluation kind of framework that we come back to and is very disconnected from the actual implementation of the SIDS agenda because I feel like that's usually what happens. <coughs> We create like the similar pathway. Nobody talks about it until at the five year mark, we all decided we needed to review what happened and talk about what's happening for the next five years. And I feel like that's what we want to avoid for this next program of action, where we try to really make the monitoring and tracking of progress really linked to tracking whether we're implementing and doing what we said we would do. And I think also a thing to maybe consider is trying to maybe align some of those targets and indicators um, to things that people are already measuring, maybe under the SDGs, under the Paris Agreement, et cetera, so that we're not creating more work that's more efficient and streamlined as well, because recognizing that SIDS don't have the capacity to do any additional monitoring evaluation in general. So if you put a set of indicators, nobody's going to really look at that and try to assess them. So it has to be very sort of streamlined, efficient, focused, 
um, and really helping them kind of assess implementation to make it practical. Can I uh, quickly react uh, once again uh, about the data and the statistical capacity? I think uh, what I'm just hearing is very relevant. And uh, I think there's a need uh, for the capacity building. And I think I was involved in the, you know, like the discussion on the MBI and other indices, you know, and the data is there, you know, the, but the, then it's like, uh, so how do we make sure that the data gets into the pipeline and, you know, and in general, it's a problem of uh, capacity constraints. And I think the UN has, you know, like the many programs that could help, you know, seats. And uh, I think there is a willingness to do so. And I think this should really transpire in, the, uh, in this and, you know, like kind of enhance like uh, uh, cross country collaborations to make sure that seats data arrives uh, you know, where it should, it should be at the international level. And also, so I think it will alleviate maybe the, the burden because like, like now the data is so scattered out and it really requires so many efforts to gather it. And so overlapping and duplication of efforts from different institutions. Uh, but if there was like a global effort of enhancing the, 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 the data capacity, I don't know how to call it, but uh, yeah, for seats, yeah, uh, yeah, I think this, you know, there is a seats issue in this, which is, which needs to be dealt with, I think, at the global level. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Are there any further comments from anyone online? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, add on the point of collecting data. If people are not readily volunteering information for a variety of reasons, but they may be incentivized if they think that by providing this data, it can be used for a common benefit, um, mm -hmm. such as grant applications, um, uh, a greater political voice, um, you know, having the ability to have an opinion in how the world um, is managed. So that's what I would point out is that they'll need, there needs to be an incentive to gather this information. And I know I was talking with James and Stacy of the um, Island Innovators, Island Innovation to collect data using the C sketch model um, in order to try to raise funds for um, promulgating a mangrove forests. And there was interest, but there was skepticism, and it was also going to require a lot of follow-up work. Um, but if you can remember to limit the data to what's necessary under the, you know, the GDPR rules, you know, not get too granular if you don't need it. And um, you know, and, and demonstrate or or um, state how it's going to be used for a common benefit. Because without that economic collusion, it's going to be very difficult for the SIDS to um, to actually have capital progress uh, economically across the board. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you so much for everything you all have been doing. Um, very interesting and. A little ways to go yet. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. If I may just add to that. Sure. No, I just, thank you for raising that point because I had this challenge when um, I was collecting, um, you know, data and especially trying to get interviews from some of the innovators um, and case studies. Um, I've had um, I had to contact a lot, and a couple of uh, many of them actually were not willing to participate in the interview because, uh, and I noticed it was mainly to do with the challenges they had and, and there was this whole attitude around, you know, um, fake it until you make it. So they were not to, you know, they, 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 they didn't want to tell the world that, okay, they're not able to, you know, get there because of whatever reasons I've noticed that. So uh, we need to think of ways, you know, especially as um, in our end, we're trying to do, what, you know, we're trying to expand the innovation mapping to get more, to do a better needs assessment. So that would be a good thing to think about. Thank you. Just one more point. There's a cultural element too, you know, especially mm -hmm. in the Asian, Asian communities. So, 
um, that needs to be navigated. But good work. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, I think we will wrap up the session. Um, thank you all very much for a very, very rich discussion. As I said before, I think there's been some really important additional contributions, things that we were not talking about yesterday, um, which need to be a kind of critical part of the, uh, the SIDS4 agenda and, and delivering that, that agenda. And I think this in particular, this sort of um, focus on um, what what could be a really sort of valuable contribution of doing um, of mo monitoring and engaging in monitoring of the um, uh, implementation of, of the CIS4 agenda is is really important and I'm glad we kind of got to discuss that a bit with you all. Um, we've taken notes. Um, everybody here has reflected on um, what you have shared with us, and um, as I said, we will try and incorporate as much of that as possible in the report which we will share with you, we'll share a draft of the report um, with everyone who participated in this meeting so that you can provide feedback, check things, make sure that we have you know, not misinterpreted something that you've said. Um, it won't capture absolutely everything, it's not going to be a really very, very long report, but hopefully it catches, captures the essence of, um, of, uh, of what we've discussed here. And um, just to say that, you know, it's our hope that we will do, be able to um, run the SIDS Future Forum again and more frequently over the next um, 10 years to, to be determined and, and depending on sort of uh, funding and support um, in order to do that. But the, um, the Civil Society Roundtable is going to hopefully become a really important feature of that and we will try and integrate better next time um, the policy and the civil society perspectives um, and think about how to organise that. Um, in a way that we can have a, a bit more sort of interaction um, between yourselves and, and the policy makers here in, uh, since policy makers here in New York. Um, but this has been a really good start and um, you know, I hope that you found it valuable and uh, enjoyable. It was very nice to, to meet you all and we will continue to be in contact. Um, we have all your contact details. Yeah. Matt. Can I just say one thing before we wrap up? Can I just give a plug for our podcast? So at Resi, we have a podcast called Small Islands Big Picture. And the most recent episode that Emily and I did was with some of the insiders of the SIDS4 process. So um, people that are planning the actual uh, summit. Um, if you could share it with your networks, we would really, really appreciate it. We're keen to get as many listeners as possible. And um, another plug, please. Uh, so, um, so ODI is working with IISD. International Institute of Sustainable Development. Yes. <laughs> so um, we're, working, we're working with them on a survey um, that will feed into the Center of Excellence. So one of the things we're trying to find out is what are the informational needs of um, civil society uh, practitioners, um, academics, um, policy makers um, across states that work in the climate mitigation and adaptation um, area. So once we get this information, we analyze it, it will be fed into, um, into the SIDS4 process and will, be, will, will help to develop the, um, the, the center of excellence to, um, to understand what information they'll need to provide going forward um, for six countries and practitioners who want to get um, the kind of information they need, best practices, information sharing, and just peer-to-peer -peer learning across it. So it's a very important initiative, but um, we're kind of having a bit of difficulty. We're aiming for 75 respondents. We only have 21 so far. So, um, so if I could just get your information from James. I will send um, an email out to all of you. Please, it's, it's literally just 15 minutes. Um, so if you complete it, it would be very helpful um, for us. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, yeah. thanks Courtney. Thanks to you all. Um, have a nice day, evening, wherever you are. Um, and we'll speak again soon. Thank you.